former and current students that I see on the list. So Emma and Alicia and Paul and Polly, it's very good to see you, virtually see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, so yes, my name is Kimberly Moran. I work on the Camden campus and I'm a forensic archeologist, which means that half the time I sit in the past and half the time I sit in the present. So sometimes I'm using forensic techniques like fingerprinting to answer archeological questions. And sometimes I'm using my skills as an archeologist and a field excavator to aid the uh, law enforcement and the police when it comes to the recovery of human remains. Um, so I have a little bit of a split personality in that sense. Um, I'm the director of the very, very new forensic science program on our campus. It's a master's of science um, and it just launched this past fall. So it's been quite an interesting opening year for this program. Um, this talk is going to be fairly interactive. So um, as Stephanie mentioned, there is a chat function. Um, if you're looking for it, just kind of toggle your mouse over the, the viewing screen and you'll see a tool that looks like a little speech bubble. And if you click on that, it'll bring up the dialog box for chat. For chat. So I'll be throwing some questions out to some of you guys, particularly some questions about bones. And so type in your answers and we'll see if you're correct or not. So here's the first question for you, not about bones. Um, I have here a picture of the lovely Rutgers Camden campus. Um, this is a picture taken if you're standing on the steps of the um, campus center. And the building that's in the background is the science building. That's where my office and the various forensic science labs are located. Um, I'm very lucky that I have a beautiful window in my office and I can look out over the campus across the kind of quad area and over to the library. Um, and I put this picture here because what I'm looking at at the moment outside my window looks very much like this picture. Everything is green and beautiful and the flowers are starting to, to blossom. But there is one thing that I do not see when I look out the window that is in this picture. And what do you think that is? Type it into the chat box. What, what is in this picture that my view is lacking? Yes, very good. Thank you, Carolyn. That is the answer. People. I sadly do not see any people at all and haven't seen any people. I don't, I do most of my work from home now, like everybody else. Um, but I have a couple of classes that require um, a lot of, of bandwidth because there are a lot of students in the class. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I come in just to teach that class, but I have not seen anyone. So I'm very sad. I put up this picture to remind me of what the, the campus normally looks like. So some of the things that we'll be talking about tonight, um, I'm going to be going over a lot of information and I'm basically going to be doing it in two halves. So the first half of tonight's presentation is going to be a little bit about bone generally, how bone is truly the coolest part of your body. The second half of this talk is going to be about what bones tell us, what do bones indicate in terms of the biological profile of an individual. Um, and again, if you guys have questions, you can tap them, you can type them into the chat function. We'll also have Q&A at the end. So one of the things that makes that make our bones so cool is that our bones have lots of function. They do a lot of things for us. Primarily, they are our support system. They are the framework that supports our body weight, that gives us attachment for muscles and tendons and ligaments. Um, they help us stay upright. You know, the term skeleton we use in lots of different ways to, to talk about the scaffolding of buildings or other sorts of structures. And that is one of our functions of our bones is to give us structure. They also allow us to move through space. So our joint systems is a series of levers and um, you know, there's lots of physics involved that help us create that movement and help us do lots of amazing and interesting things. And our bones protect us. Uh, they are our hard protective shell. You know, some animals have their hard protective shells on the, on the outside of their body. Ours are inside of us. So they protect our internal organs, lots of really important things. Our heart, our liver, our lungs, and our brain is encased uh, because it is and it's very special and very precious to us. And it also helps us um, produce and store nutrients. So our bones are where our uh, red blood cells, bl excuse me, where our red uh, cells, blood cells are formed. Uh, they help us store fats that we can retrieve in times of need, and they help us store other minerals like calcium and phosphorus. Um, and our bones are dynamic. They are absorbing minerals and they are releasing minerals as and when our body needs it. So they're, they also kind of help keep our body in a, in a state of stasis as well. 
In terms of the kind of anatomy of bone, um, our bones are primarily made up of two different types of bones two different kind of structural components in an adult skeleton. Things are very different when you are an infant when you're first born. But in an adult ske skeleton, you have two main types of bone. You have compact bone or cortical bone. This is like the outer shell of your bone. And then you have inside of that spongy bone, or sometimes it's called trabecular bone. Um, and you can see here in this image, you should be able to see my mouse here, that you've got the spongy elements of your bone at the end of your bone. These are known as the epiphyses of the bone. And then you've got a big kind of hollow area in the middle of the bone, the shaft or the diaphysis of the bone. And then all of that is encased in your compact or cortical, cortical bone. And again, these different types of your bone have different functions as well. Um, so again, this empty area is where uh, some of your marrow is stored. You have two different types of bone marrow, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, you have kind of a membrane that surrounds the bone called the periosteum, um, and that has a lot to do with the, um, the veins that supply your bones with blood because your, your bones exchange blood just like your, all the other cells in your body. So the compact or the cortical bone is solid, it's dense, it's smooth. It really is like that outer shell of your bone. Um, it, it's the external surface, it gives uh, the bone, your bone walls to it, and um, it's not imper impenetrable though, and I'll show you an example in just a minute. It's where the yellow marrow of your bone is stored, so this is the marrow that stores fat, um, and it's located in that central area is where your yellow marrow is in the bone shaft. The ends of your epiphyses, where your joints come together, those are covered also with this compact bone. And then that compact bone has a further, uh, further uh, covering of cartilage to protect the two ends of the bone from rubbing each other. When you have a, a form of arthritis, that cartilage has disintegrated and you actually have bones rubbing against each other, which anyone who suffers from this knows is very painful. Um, what it does for us, at the, at the other end, when we're examining bones, is we actually see the bones polishing each other. So this compact bone can be very, become very smooth and uh, shiny. It almost looks like marble from that polishing action. The trabecular bone or the spongy bone um, is gonna be underneath of that outer layer. It's very porous, it's very lightweight. Um, if your bone was just solid and dense, you would, you would weigh a lot more than you weigh now. So this, again, kind of helps facilitate movement. It means it takes less effort. And depending on the type of animal, they might have more or less spongy bone. Um, birds, for instance, have very, very lightweight bones because obviously they need to, to fly. So they have a lot of spongy bone and very little cortical bone. It has this kind of honeycomb structure and we'll look at some of the cellular structure in just a minute. And we find this again at the ends of bones. We find this in your vertebrae. Uh, your vertebrae is largely the spongy bone. Um, inside short, flat bones, like your, your scapula and your sternum. And this is where your red marrow is stored. And this is what makes your red blood cells and your white blood cells. Um, the name trabecula comes from these little tiny bone kind of spicules um, that make up that kind of uh, spongy structure, the trabeculae. So again, another image of bone anatomy here. So we've got, again, that hard cortical bone. We've got the uh, cavity where your, ye your yellow marrow is stored, and you've got the spongy or trabecular bone where your red marrow is stored. So one of the things I really love about bone is the fact that it's made up of both organic and inorganic constituents. The organic part of your bone is the part that's alive. And when we look at skeletons, and we'll look at some in just a minute, we don't see any of that organic bit. Anything that was organic has decomposed. And what we're left with is the inorganic part of your bone. So the living part of your bone is made up of bone cells, several different types of bone cells. And again, this is what allows your bone to grow, to repair itself, um, to respond to stimuli, you know, ten tension, uh, gives you flexibility, all kinds of great functions. Um, and that actually is an image of a uh, bone cell, uh, an MRI, a um, scanning electron microscope image. You've got three different types of bone cells that do have different functions and do different things. So osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. We'll look at them in just a minute. And uh, these bone cells produce these long, flexible fl fibers of collagen that ultimately stitch themselves together to make up your to make up the living part of your bone. The inorganic part of the bone is what I'm going to show you guys here is 
this part, the part that we find in archaeology or forensic anthropology or any of these various fields. So this bit is no longer alive. This is completely comprised of, uh, of minerals. So I'm going to stand back a little bit here. So here's a question for you guys. Can you tell me what bone this is? Go ahead and type it in the text box, the text box if you know which bone of the body this is, what its, what its name is. Yes, it is the femur. Good job, Eric. Yeah, it is the femur. It is the largest bone in the body. It is your upper hip. So this is the ball joint that goes into your socket. Um, but nothing that you see here was ever alive. All of this, again, is the mineral component of your bone. And it's a mineral known as hydroxyapatite ap or apatite. Um, and we actually have rocks that are made out of apatite. Um, so your bone is basically li living rock. It's rock that can repair itself. It's rock that can grow. It's rock that changes itself. We say that your bones are dynamic. They never stop moving around while you're alive. And we call this process remodeling. We'll see this, that name will come up uh, in a few slides, uh, where your bone is reshaping itself all the time, dependent on your nutrition, on the sort of activities that you do, the sort of injuries you might experience. It's always doing something um, until, until you pass away and all the organic components of your bone uh, decompose. So some of the uh, cells, osteoblasts, are the cells that form bone. They um, synthesize all the different minerals and they put them all together and they deposit kind of uh, virgin bone material. And they're located just beneath that, uh, the periosteum, that membrane that uh, shields your bone and feeds it with various blood vessels and things. It produces this kind of pre-bone tissue, the osteoid, it's very rich in collagen. Um, and eventually that collagen hardens and forms your bone matrix. So it is kind of similar to when you get a cast on um, after you've broken a bone, where you have this kind of webbed or mesh material um, that starts off kind of moist and damp, and then it hardens and it becomes very solid and impermeable. It's kind of a similar concept. These cells are only active during the initial bone production, um, and they are active at sites of bone injury where they need to repair and lay down this new material. And most of the other time, they're relatively dormant. They, they only kind of spring into action when we need them to build some bone for us. Osteocytes are mature bone cells. So bone cells that are just kind of doing their day-to-day -day thing. Um, they live mainly in the trabecular area of the bone. So this is kind of some of that spongy bone kind of blown up. And um, they have these kind of interesting kind of circular patterns, almost like uh, the rings on a tree as they kind of build bone and, um, and keep your bones healthy and maintains them. So those osteoblasts blasts that are building bone eventually become these osteocytes, these mature bone cells. Um, they're found again in those little, uh, these little kind of pockets inside the trabecular bone known as lacunae. Osteoclasts are my personal favorite bone cells. If you could have a favorite bone cell, it would be, it would be the osteoclast because their job is to absorb bone. They actually break bone down. So you have some bone cells that are building bone and then other bone cells that are breaking the bone away. And this is where that remodeling comes from, that your bones are recycling themselves all the time. Um, so yeah, that's the remodeling, the reshaping of the bone. It takes place continuously throughout your life. Um, so some examples of that, again, some of my favorite examples of that is uh, when you lost your baby teeth. Now, if any of you guys have had an adult tooth that's been pulled and you've seen what that looks like versus a baby tooth that's just naturally fallen out, what are the baby teeth missing that you see on an adult tooth when it's pulled out at the dentist? Type that into your tax into your text box. What do baby teeth not have when they fall out? And it's one of the reasons why they fall out. Thanks, Paul. Yes, roots. Your baby teeth don't have any roots. Well, why is that? That's because these osteoclasts actually reabsorb those roots. They break down the roots of your baby teeth to enable your baby teeth to fall out. At the same time, they're also breaking down bone that's inside your jaw. Um, and it's forming these little pockets called crypts. Inside these little pockets, those osteoblasts are taking those minerals and they're recycling them and they're starting to build your adult teeth. So your adult teeth are actually built out of some of the components of your baby teeth. I think that's pretty cool. And then the two bones work, the two types of cells work together to absorb and build bone 
to gradually push those teeth, that's called eruption, push those teeth out of your adult jaw, um, and then they seal up that crypt, seal up that hole, and your jaw is, is whole again. So it's a pretty neat process of how all these different um, cells work together to reshape yourself. Um, another example is I have here uh, a jawbone, a mandible. So um, some of you guys that are familiar with some of my projects know that I have a, a very large project from Philadelphia. It was a cemetery that was disturbed during um, a private construction uh, project. It resulted in a very large excavation and we have about 500 individuals that have been excavated from this cemetery. We're in the process of a very big collaborative research project, multi-institutional collaborative research project to understand um, a snapshot of life from colonial Philadelphia. And then all these remains will be reburied um, where they were supposed to go back in 1860, a cemetery called Mount Moriah out in Southwest Philly. So this is one of the individuals from the, uh, we call it the Arch Street Project. It's the first Baptist Church of Philadelphia that was located on Arch Street, the cemetery. Um, and this individual is um, missing quite a few of their teeth. This lady was very, very old when she died. I mean, well, well over 65 or 70. Um, but if you notice, she has that kind of stereotypical kind of crone's jaw, that kind of jutting outward jaw. Um, and again, this is another example of the osteoclast and blast working together. As you lose teeth, your jaw will reshape, it will remodel itself to compensate for the lack of teeth. And that produces this kind of stereotypical jutting out of the jaw. Um, so it's one way that we can age individuals by looking at how obtuse the angle of the jaw is. But again, it's just your bone cells going to work. So these osteoclasts do their job by having a, a, an enzyme that they secrete that basically breaks down the bone. So again, just looking at bone from a macroscopic view all the way down to the microscopic, you start off with kind of your sheet of bone. Uh, so if this was a rib, for instance, you'd have your outer layer of compact bone um, sandwiching in between some uh, tubercular bone or spongy bone. The spongy bone kind of blown up, you know, looks like its name suggests, like a sponge. And if you take an area of that and, mi and magnify that uh, further, you find these um, lamellae kind of structures, these kind of tree rings, and inside those tree rings are where all the bone cells live. Um, looking at the cortical bone, the, the dense compact bone, it also has this kind of tree ring structure. Um, and this is one way that we can identify human bone from animal mode. This is unique to humans. So if we find a tiny little fragment of bone, and I have, uh, I have here in this little jar a little fragment of bone. This was one that was found at uh, an archaeological site in uh, South Jersey called Whispering Woods in Salem County. Um, it turns out this archaeological site has a pretty substantial Native American, um, pro you know, really a settlement there. And in the course of doing some excavations with some of our students, some of our Rutgers students, we did find some little fragments of bone. Um, but looking at it under the microscope, we can tell that this is animal bone and not human bone. If it was human bone, we'd have some problems on our hands. Um, and so again, here's what it looks like under the microscope. We've got these, um, these cool kind of tree ring structures, which is where all the bone cells live. Now, bone is very cool macroscopically or microscopically. It's just a really fascinating structure that we all carry around with us every day. So in terms of the types of bones, you have 206 bones when you're an adult. But when you're born, you have way, way many more. You have over 300 bones as an infant. What happens to those bones? How come you have more when you're born than when you're an adult? Any guesses? Type it into the chat box. Why do you have more bones as an infant than you do as an adult? Yes, thank you, Alicia. They fuse together. So when you are born, I'll go back to our femur here. This singular bone as an adult would be three separate bones when you're first born. You'll, the shaft is going to be separate from the ends, the epiphyses. And as you grow, they fuse to form a singular bone. So that's basically what's happening there. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, in terms of those 206 bones, they're put into categories, basically just on what they look like. Um, so you have long bones and short bones. You can kind of collectively call them long bones, but they're basically all of the bones that are straight, 
that uh, don't have any weird or funky features. They're, they're, pretty, they're pretty straightforward. Um, so your arms and your legs would be your long bone. Your phalanges are your fingers and your toes. Um, over half the bones in your body are in your hands and feet because there are just so many little tiny bones there. Um, and many of them look like teeny tiny little rocks, particularly when you get into the hand and the foot bones. Um, so as a forensic archeologist, I am not a bone expert. I know enough about bones to inform what I'm doing as an archeologist as I excavate, but I could never testify in court as a bone expert. Um, and you know, it's really important to have bone experts working alongside archeologists because again, sometimes those things that you might excavate you could, if you don't know better, mistake them for a rock and think that they're not important when actually it's bone. So really, anthropologists and archaeologists should always work together on an excavation, whether it's forensic or whether it's academic. Um, your skull is made up of 28 separate bones in total. Well, it kind of depends on who you ask, and it depends if they're, if they're including the mandible or not. But if you include everything, it comes down to 28 bones. Um, so I have here, again, an, a different individual from the Art Street Cemetery. And you can see all the squiggly lines. Each of these individual plates is a separate bone. And they're held together by these joints that um, are made up of these kind of interlocking squiggles. So they don't really move around or uh, fall apart or anything like that unless you break the structure, then they definitely fall apart. Um, and all of them together make up your skull. You've got uh, eight bones inside your nose. Your palate is made up of separate bones. Um, the inside of your eye socket is separate from the front of your eye socket. Um, it's really quite cool. And it's, it's particularly fantastic when you get to work with each of those individual bones. Because again, when you learn about bones, you have to learn about all the separate plates, not just the entire structure. Um, if you excavate um, children or infants who have passed away, you don't find a skull, you find all those separate plates. So again, that's why you have to learn them all separately and their structures. Um, so the innominate, the ox coxa, is your pelvis. And your pelvis comes in two halves. You know, we tend to think of the pelvis as a complete set, but that's actually called the pelvic girdle when you have both halves of the pelvis and the sacrum together. When you excavate a skeleton, you just get one at a time. Um, and it's called, well, I was trained to call it the innominate because I was trained in the United Kingdom. So I know, knew, know all the English terms for everything. Um, here in the United States, People are trained to call it the ox coxa. It doesn't really make any difference. But the reason why it's called the innominate, um, or the reason why one of the terms is the innominate, is because all these different bone names come from the Greeks. They were the first to really study kind of medicine and give names to things. And the Greeks named the bones based on what they thought they looked like. So patella, your kneecap, um, actually means a, a cup, and it does kind of sort of look like a cup. Um, your Scapula, your shoulder bone, actually means shovel. And anyone want to guess what bone this is? You guys might have broken it if you've played sports. Might be into the text box if you think you know what bone this is. It is, it's the clavicle. Um, and clavicle means little key. And it does kind of look like a key. So when the Greeks came to this bone, they were like, well, I don't really know what that looks like. Um, so they called it the innominate, no name. It's the only bone that has no name. Um, your teeth are a type of bone. They have a different kind of composition and structure, but they are classified as bone. Your ribs, your vertebrae, and then you have kind of the irregular or the other category, the things that don't really fit into what we've mentioned above. So like your, your, your shoulder bone, your collarbone, your sternum, all that sort of stuff. So at the very beginning, we talked about how your bones are the scaffolding that your muscles hang from. So in order to attach those muscles, we need tendons and ligaments. So tendons connect muscle to bone and ligaments connect bone to bone. And we see these attachments on bone all the time. So uh, on the end of this femur here, there's kind of a very well-defined ridge. That is an area of bone attachment. Um, other areas like Got a bump on the back of this guy's head, which we'll come back to later. That's also an area of muscle attachment. And so the more muscular you are, the, the more robust your muscles, the more robust these attachment sites as well. So we can use these ridges and these lumps and bumps where we know that ligaments and tendons connect to, to get a better understanding of the physical strength of the individual, um, to also sometimes help us determine male from female, um, and you know, lots of different functions like that. 
So one of the things I don't like about bones, why I probably didn't become a forensic anthropologist, is there's lots of terminology. You have to do lots of memorization. All those, all those lumps and bumps and all those muscle attachments, they all have names. Everything on a bone has names. Um, and there's lots of terminology that you need to use in terms of you know, anatomically referencing where something is in the skeleton. So I'm just going to go over some of that because I don't want to bore you guys the way I get bored by terminology. So cranial is just anything related to the anatomy of the skull. And therefore, postcranial is anything under the skull. So basically, most of your skeleton is postcranial. The axial bones are the bones that make up the head and the trunk, kind of the, the axis of the body. And then the appendicular parts of the body are your limbs, the things that kind of fly out from the center. Your skull, again, has 28 bones. Um, again, it's there mainly to protect your brain. And there's lots of uh, very, very important blood vessels and nerve endings that kind of tunnel up through the, the cranial bones. Um, and kind of see here at the base of the skull, there's, there's lots of little openings where things go through. Again, they all have their own individual names that have to be memorized if you go into the field. The trunk, the axial postcranial part of the bone has 50, or of the skeleton, has 52 bones in total. It protects all of your soft, squishy bits, all your internal organs that keep you going. Um, there is some movement that is allowed, like being able to breathe in and out. Um, so your uh, rib cage is not solid. In fact, there are some uh, genetic diseases that will turn um, cartilage into bone. And most people who die of that particular disease die because they can no longer breathe in because their uh, ribs no longer expand anymore. Your vertebral column protects your spinal cord. That is, that is really its main function. And it also allows for some movement and flexibility as well. And also um, uh, your ability to walk upright as well. Yeah, mobility. The appendicular uh, area of the bones allows us to do all the fun things that we can do as humans, allows us to grasp, again, allows us uh, to be mobile and to move through space. And I mentioned before that a typical long, long bone has a shaft a diaphysis, which again is where the uh, bone marrow is stored, where the fatty bone marrow is stored. Um, and it's also what's known as the primary ossification center. So that's the bit that you are definitely born with in the form of bone. The epiphyses, the ends of your long bones, are known as a secondary ossification center. So that's where you, when you think of like your growth plates, your ability for that long bone to grow outward. Uh, the metaphysis is these kind of flared ends that have all the cartilage that, again, help with um, your joints and your mobility. So again, our typical long bone, whenever you think of the growth plate, it's this bit here that's in the middle. So when you were born, this epiphysis is separate from your diaphysis and they fuse together. And eventually you'll just see what's known as the line of fusion, which you kind of see here on this individual, that's a bit of a line of fusion. This poor guy uh, definitely had some nutritional issues he, his bones have not fused properly. At the age that he is when he died, he, shouldn't have have, he should not have had any line of fusion left. It should have been eradicated and he should have had a solid fused bone. But because of nutritional issues, it didn't fuse properly. And eventually, those, those uh, lines of fusion will fuse all together. And in some cases, even the joints of the skull will fuse together. So osteogenesis is the process of bone uh, mineralizing during development. I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. And again, you end up with this woven bone uh, when you're first born that's kind of immature, uh, immature and unorganized, but it grows very rapidly and it uh, repairs very easily. So this is what you get when you are first born. You've got this primary ossification center. And then you have the kind of immature bone at the end. And eventually that uh, immature bone starts to ossify, starts to turn into bone. Um, and eventually it'll start to fuse together until you have your adult bone. And then the modeling is kind of the action of your, your bone cells to kind of sculpt your bone growth. And then as you 
live your life and have different activities and put different stressors on your bones, your bones will remodel throughout your life until you pass away. So bones are great, they're amazing. But bones can also tell us a lot of stuff as well. Um, and this is the part that as a forensic scientist and uh, someone who does archeology span and bioarchaeology, I'm more interested in this. So bones are great besides being really cool in terms of their morphology and science and structure, but they're great because they answer a lot of questions for us. So as an investigator, whether I'm working archeologically or whether I'm working forensically, if I come across a bone, these are the sorts of questions or the kind of flow of information I'm gonna go through. So first of all, what part of the body did the bone come from? So in the case here, when I showed you guys this bone, we said it was a femur, so it comes from the leg. Is the bone whole or partial? It's mostly whole, but there's definitely some damage that's been done on the ends here. So some of that cortical bone has been broken away, exposing the trabecular bone underneath. How long has the bone been in the ground? Well, I can see that the bone has been stained the same color of the soil. So that tells me it's been in the ground for a little while, long enough for everything to decompose. And newly decomposed bone tends to be kind of waxy and it still has kind of a fatty consistency to it. That's definitely gone. This is what's known as dry bone. So that tells us that the bone has been around for a very long time. Um, as an archeologist, I would use other things like the style of the coffin or what kind of clothing the individual was in to determine whether it was a historic burial, something that is 70 years or older, or if it's a forensic burial, something that is 70 years or less. Is the bone human? I spend a lot of time being sent emails of bones <laughs> that people have found wanting to know what, what it is that they found and if it is human or not. And fortunately, I have not yet been sent a picture of a bone that is indeed human. But, you know, this is probably the first thing that a police officer is gonna wanna know, is this bone human? Um, when I was doing my degree in the United Kingdom, um, I would come home for holidays and stuff and all of, um, all of my parents' neighbors knew what I was doing and knew what I was studying in school. So all year long, they would collect fun things for me to identify for them when I came home for holidays. Um, so sometimes it would be pieces of pottery that they found when they were on holiday in Greece. Uh, one person gave me like a whole sack of broken pot sherds and wanted me to tell her something amazing about them. There really wasn't a whole lot I could say about some broken pot sherds in a bag. Um, and one year I came home and my next door neighbor came over with his son, who was like maybe six or seven. And they were all excited because they had this shoebox. And inside the shoebox was a bone. They had been on the beach and they found this bone and they wanted to know what it was. You know, was it Native American? Um, you know, was it, was it worth something? Was it maybe from a murder scene and they should contact the police? So they handed me this shoebox and I opened it up and wrapped up in some tissue paper, I unwrapped this bone, and I had a look at it. And I said, well, I hate to tell you this, but you got someone's KFC meal. It was a chicken bone. Somebody was just having lunch on the beach and just threw their trash and these, these guys found this bone and thought it was something you know spectacular. I hated to burst their bubble, but that happens from time to time. Um, a year or two ago, I was in my office here at Rutgers Camden, and I got a call from the chief of, RU, of the RUPD. Um, there was some um, sewer works that they were doing on campus, and the, the person digging the hole found a bone, and it was like Christmas. I got on my lab coat, and I got on my gloves, and I ran out there, and I actually have it here on my shelf. This is what they found in the middle of Camden City. It is not human. It is uh, a sheep or a goat, probably a sheep. It's a, it's a sub-adult or juvenile. Um, so it was probably someone's lamb dinner, um, but it was super exciting for like that five minutes. Um, and now it sits on my shelf up there. <laughs> so yeah, that's, you know, that's a large part of this job is just, you know, determining whether something is human or not. And sometimes you can't tell. Sometimes a bone is so badly broken or it's so badly weathered that you have to go to microscopic analysis and you have to look for those little tree ring structures to determine whether it's human or not. If it isn't human, then what animal did it come from? So as an archaeologist, I probably know more animal bones than I know human bones because archaeologically, that's more likely what I'm going to be coming across. So you have to learn the difference between horse, cow, pig, sheep, goats, um, kind of general carnivores, 
um, fish, birds, kind of just in general categories, um, and you know, be able to identify some of those kind of animal groups. If it is human, then things start to get a little more interesting. Then we start constructing what we call the biological profile. So if it is human, is it male or female? What age was the person at the time that they died? And these age ranges are pretty broad. So are they an infant? That's around zero to about two. A child is gonna be two to about 12. An adolescent's gonna be 12 to about 16. A young adult is gonna be 16 to about 23. And an old adult is anybody older than the age of 23. So I don't know what the median age of my audience is tonight, but probably most of you guys would fit into the old adult range. And we'll find out why you're considered an old adult in just a minute. What was their state of health when they died? Did they have any diseases? Are there any signs of trauma? And can we work out the cause of death, why they died? Sometimes bones can help with this, sometimes they can't. So the biological profile is the main thing that we're trying to construct. And the biological profile is made up of the sex of the individual, their ancestry, their age at death, their height, their stature, and then any kind of distinguishing features. So again, the trauma, pathology, any signs of injury, disease, their state of health, that sort of thing. Um, it can get a little tricky when it comes to sex and ancestry. It kind of depends on the population that you're working with. Um, so first of all, in bones, we talk about sex, not gender, because gender is how you present yourself when you're alive. Your sex is what kind of chromosomes you have. And that does come forward in your bones. Um, there hasn't been a lot of research with the transgender community to see if um, using hormones alters bones because a lot of the muscle attachments on bones that make bones robust or gracile, as we'll see in a minute, is very hormone driven. Um, what limited research has been done has been done on actual casework where sadly members of the transgender community have been murdered um, and there's been an analysis of the remains. Um, but that is such a small sample size, so we don't really know how hormone replacement affects um, some of these markers on bone yet. Ancestry is also a tricky thing because, um, first of all, we don't talk about race. Race has to do with your identity and what populations you associate with. Ancestry, again, has to do with genetic markers that influence some of the morphology of bone. Um, and in some cases, those markers can be very clear and, you know, seemingly obvious, and in other cases, they're less clear. Um, there is a database known as FORDISC, which has uh, a bunch of measurements of different population groups. And the idea is that you measure up a bone, you put in all those measurements, and it spits out like a likelihood of somebody being part of a particular um, ancestry category. But the problem with this is this database is hugely incomplete. It basically has no information on people from Middle Eastern origin. Um, and it's also severely underrepresented in the African-American uh, community and other kind of you know, traditionally uh, underrepresented groups. So we really don't have a good, as good of a grasp around ancestry as we really should, particularly forensically. For historic populations where there's less kind of movement and exchange of genetic information, it can be a little bit, and I'll put in air quotes, easier, um, but we have a long way to go when it comes to ancestry. And anthropology, has a long history of being super racist. So we also have, uh, you know, many sins from our academic past that we are, we are trying to repair. So sexual dimorphism, determining if something is male or female, this is the expression of different observable traits between males of a uh, species and females. And it's gonna relate to differences in size and shape, but compared to other animals, humans have very little sexual dimorphism. Males and females are very similar compared to many other species. We've got a couple of examples here of just, you know, some sexual dimorphism from humans, gorilla, from a type of bird and from salmon. And, you know, their males and females look much more different than our males and females do. But generally, Males of the Homo sapien species tend to be larger, more robust, um, and they tend to have longer, thicker, heavier bones, again, because of uh, more dense muscles, and they tend to have more prominent muscle attachments. Females on the opposite end of the spectrum are what we call gracile, so their bones tend to be smaller, more lightweight, um, less pronounced muscles, much muscle attachments, 
But as you can see here, I've got two extremes of the spectrum. I've got very male and very female. And most of us don't look like either of these images. We're somewhere in between. And it's the same thing with bones as well. You have some skeletons that can look very, very male or very, very gracile, but most skeletons are somewhere in between. So you want to use a multitude of different markers before you make that determination of maleness or femaleness, because there's lots of opportunity to get it wrong. There's lots of what we call cognitive bias in bioanthropology, forensic anthropology. So the information that we're given can cause anthropologists to come up with incorrect conclusions. Going back to the transgender um, example, one of the particular cases was a case where a skeleton was found and around the skeleton were, were, you know, for lack of a better term, artifacts that were associated with femaleness. So there were high heels, there was um, uh, a purse, there were um, silicon breast in, implants. And so the anthropologist at the time determined that the skeleton was female. When it was re-examined a couple of decades later, it turned out that, that it was male. So the whole time that they were looking through missing persons records, they were, you know, looking for for somebody who was not the skeleton. So also in anthropology, and again, this is where kind of the bias comes in, is that a lot of the assessments are non-metric. They are visual inspection. And that doesn't mean they don't work. We'll see with some of the skeletons that I'm going to show you guys in a minute that it most of the time works, works perfectly fine. There are just some instances where you get people that are really kind of in the middle of the spectrum and it can be very difficult to make that determination or they can have some aspects that present as very female and others that look very male. What is better is a metric analysis where you take lots of measurements, um, particularly on the skull. There are lots of reference points, um, like where these various joints meet up. That would be considered a reference point. Um, there's a reference point down there as well. So there are many measurements that you can do that can go into some of these databases that will tell you if something is more likely to be male or female. So it's more scientific and it's more objective. But again, a lot of the sample sizes that these algorithms are based on aren't always very large. Um, so they really need, you know, we don't have very good population statistics like we would in a field like DNA. Um, we can talk about why we don't DNA bones on a regular basis at the end. So we'll start with the pelvis. The pelvis is probably my least favorite bone for doing um, sex determination, um, usually because what you get is something like this. You don't get a nice pelvic girdle like the image here. If you had both halves, if you had everything nicely together, it would be pretty easy to do. So what really drives the um, morphology of the pelvis? It really comes down to childbirth. So women need to have an open wide pelvis to support uh, a fetus and also to provide a different kind of center of gravity and men tend to have more narrow, slender uh, hips, for lack of a better term. Um, there's some other features that are on the um, pelvis that we'll look at in a minute. Um, so the two pelvic bones fit together. They're held together by cartilage. It's not a solid bone. Um, and they articulate at this point in the middle called the pubic synthesis. This will become important in a minute when we talk about aging a bone. Your nominate is composed of three separate bones that that start off separate when you're born and they fuse together into a solid bone. And there's little other little aspects as well. So again, I was talking about how this, this poor guy did not have very good nutrition. He's got some elements here that are not necessarily as fused as they should be for his age. So there's a line of fusion there along the crest of the ilium um, that shouldn't be there. It fuses into a solid bone between the ages of 13 and 15, assuming that you've got all the right nutritional inputs. So some of the things that we look at in terms of determining the sex is there's this function here, which is called the greater sciatic notch. For men, it tends to be a little more closed, a little more hairpin, like this particular guy. And for women, it's much uh, broader and more open, as you see in the image down here. The other thing that we like to look at is we look at the angle of the pubic synthesis. So again, men have a pretty narrow angle, pretty closed angle whereas women have a much wider, more open angle. So you guys haven't guessed it already, this is a male half of the pelvis. There are some other weird things as well. Uh, there's something called the arc composé. I don't know who came up with this, but it totally works. Uh, the arc composé uh, basically says you draw an imaginary arch that connects 
uh, the top of the auricular surface, which is right here, to the end of the greater sciatic notch. And if it makes a nice arc, it's a female. If it kind of jets off into space, it's a male. And sure enough, this is a male. I don't know. Some French guy came up with that, but it does work. What I like to use for determining male and female is the skull, because as you can see, there are lots of different things that you can look at. But also, as you can see, they're on a sliding scale of feminine to masculine. So the first thing I like to look at, I'm going to not go in necessarily in this order, is something called the mastoid process. The mastoid process is the bump behind your ear. So if you feel behind your ear, you feel this kind of a hard area there, you are feeling this structure, that hole there is where your ear is located. And for men, they have a fairly large and prominent mastoid process. And as you can see in this chart, number five is very male. And for women, not so much. And that's kind of the overall theme is that men are have large prominent things and women not so much. The next thing I like to look at is called, well, in the United Kingdom, it's called the external occipital protuberance. It basically means the bump on the back of your head. So occipital is the back of the head. Um, it's external, it's on the outside, and it's a protuberance, it's a bump. Um, here in the United States, they tend to call it the nuchal crest. It is a muscle attachment. So you can see it on that guy there. You can feel it on yourself. If you kind of feel halfway down the back of your head, you'll feel that you have kind of a knobby protuberance there. And if you put your hands underneath of that and move your head up and down, you can feel your neck muscles. So that bump is where your neck muscles attach. So for men with big, strong necks, they're going to have a very prominent nuchal crest or external occipital protuberance. And for women, not so much. So that's what we're seeing right here is on a scale of one being female and five being male, the prominence of the external occipital protuberance. Um, there are other things that you can look at as well. Men have lumpy eyebrows. Women, we have smooth forehead. Um, men tend to have a rounder shape to their skull. Women tend to have more of an almond-shaped skull. Um, and then if you have the mandible, the lower jaw, you can look at things like the end of the jaw. Men tend to have a very square chin, and they tend to have a very square jaw, whereas women, we have more of a pointy jaw, and we have more of an obtuse angle. So again, the skull has lots of great tools. That's probably my favorite one. But they don't always agree with each other. You can have a skull that half of these look very feminine and half of these look very male. And so you have to make your best guess or break out the calipers and start measuring. So the metric analysis is going to be more reliable than just kind of the visual assessments. Um, again, it's still based on the assumption that male bones are larger than female bones. Um, and that is largely true, but things like nutrition play a role, uh, physical activity play a role. One of the things with the Art Street Project is we have a lot of women who have very prominent arm muscle attachments, whether they were washerwomen or whatever, they were carrying great heavy loads on a, on a regular basis. Um, if you have a man who uh, have a skeleton of an individual who was probably paralyzed uh, from a back injury, and he has hardly any muscle attachments at all. That's why we think he's paralyzed because he wasn't using his muscles after, after that injury. This is what the metric analysis looks like. All these different fields, all these different measurements that you add in and you and it spits out a, a result at the end. And some other things to think about when you're trying to work out the sex of the individual. Again, as I mentioned, it's gonna be influenced by your genetics, your nutritional, your, your nutrition and overall state of health. Um, most of these estimates should have a greater than 50% accuracy rate because you're always gonna be right half the time um, if it's just male or female. Um, really anything that's less than 80% accurate is considered unreliable. And you really cannot determine the sex of an individual before they are 14 years old. Um, it's really only once uh, the puberty hormones kick in that you start to get sexual dimorphism. So aging a skeleton, and I see that I'm running out of time, so I'll try to speed up, but we are almost done. So aging children is pretty easy. We've got a couple of different tools that we can use. The first tool that we can use is tooth eruption. How old were you when you lost your first tooth? If you can remember, type it into the text box. How old were you when you lost your first tooth?
And can you remember what was the first tooth that you lost? Eric says five. Anybody else? And can you remember what your first tooth was that you lost? My, my, one of my children was rather odd. He didn't start losing his teeth until very late. But typically, typically most people lose their tooth, their first teeth at five. Typically it tends to be, it is a front tooth. Okay, so we're getting answers saying front teeth. It tends to be your bottom front teeth that you lose first, followed by your top two front teeth, and then they start working their way outward. So we have a pretty good understanding of the ages that teeth form before they come out in the first place, the age when they fall out and the age when they erupt. What are the last set of teeth that come in? What are they called? Most of you have probably had them pulled. Yes, your wisdom teeth. And about what age are you when they start coming in? They really vary widely, but 20. They can vary anywhere between 16 to about 20 for eruption. And if you guys remember that you are considered a young adult at around 16, what age do you think you are when they finish their eruption? You remember back. So yes, they come, they finish eruption between the ages of 23 to 26. It's kind of a, an age range. Um, and so that is one reason why you are considered an old adult at the age of 23 to 26, because your teeth have all fully formed, they've all erupted, and now they're just gonna start to wear down and fall out. Here's thought there. The other tool that we have is bone fusion. So just like with your teeth, coming in and falling out, we have a really good set of information of which bones fuse at which ages. Again, all things being equal. What do you think is the last bone to fuse in your body? It was one that I showed earlier when I was going through the different like Greek names. Give you guys a clue. It is, it is the clavicle. Where'd my clavicle go? Here we go. It is the last bone to fuse. How old do you think you are when it fuses? Yep, that's right. You are 23 to 26. So by the age of 23 to 26, all your teeth are formed, all your bones are fused. There is no more growing that you are going to do. You are now going to begin the process of aging. And that is why you are considered an old adult. There's, there's nowhere more to go but down. So after this age, it gets a little more difficult to age a skeleton at the time of death. Um, you can look at how teeth wear out. I'll show some charts in a minute, but we are losing that function. Um, and then this brings us to the pubic synthesis. So here's our chart here of all your different teeth and when they erupt, the different kind of age ranges. Some of these ranges can be, you know, pretty large, like 10, well, I guess it's 10 to six months, uh, but even like 17 to 21, that's kind of a, a wide age range if you're like looking for a missing person, for instance. Um, and we have on the next slide, I'll show you bone fusion as well. So traditionally, our teeth are not meant to last. That's why we get our set of wisdom teeth because um, our teeth start wearing down traditionally pretty early on and potentially falling out. So those wisdom teeth were kind of like an extra, like a bonus set of teeth in case you were starting to already lose them. Um, so when we look at archeological populations like the Arch Street material, we see something that looks like this. We see patterns of wear that occur over time. Um, your front teeth wear down first and they work their way backwards. So your first molar wears down before your second and then your third one is the last one to wear down. And what you end up seeing is something that looks like this. It's not black in the center, it's actually kind of a yellow. That's the dentine, the center of your tooth that's exposed. And then it'll have a white ring of the remaining, um, of the remaining enamel. And I'm just looking to see if, if you can tell on our really old lady. A really old lady is not, her teeth are not too bad, except for the fact that they fell out. Um, you can see though that she has a dental caries, a cavity there that's left a big hole in her tooth. But her one remaining tooth there in the back, which is gonna be a wisdom tooth, 
it's not, we don't have any dentine that's exposed, but she has worn down the cusps. They are pretty flat. So they look kind of like maybe in that range there, this particular person. But yeah, we used to be able to do that. Sadly though, well, I mean, maybe not sadly, it's a good thing. We've got modern dentistry, so we don't lose our teeth like we used to. We don't get cavities the way that we used to. And we have lots of processed food, so our food doesn't wear down our teeth like it used to. So in modern populations, you really can't use dental wear to, to uh, age an individual at death. Bone fusion, our other tool for juveniles and subadults. Um, again, I mentioned those growth plates there. You can see here, we've got a range of ages where things fuse. Um, so this person, it looks like their sacrum, uh, the joints of their sacrum are fusing all the way out to 32. But generally, most fusion happens around the age of 26. But then after that, we don't really have that tool anymore to age a skeleton. What we are starting to look at is something called the pubic synthesis. So we've got something called the Suchi Brooks method. I'm not a huge believer in the Suchi Brooks method, but maybe that's just, just because I was never very good at it. Um, at the end of the pubic synthesis here, you can see there's a series of kind of wavy ridges and lumps and bumps. And this particular lady who was working in Tennessee and looking at the material from the body farm at the University of Tennessee, started to notice that certain age ranges tended to have a similar pattern of lumps and bumps on them. And she was able to come up with this system, one system for females, one system for males, that it gave, again, a very wide, in some cases, very wide age range um, of an individual based on what their pubic synthesis looked, at, looked like. It's not great. You know, being able to tell that somebody's between the age of 42 and 87 is not always very helpful. But at the moment, it's the only thing that we've got. So unless somebody is able to find a different morphological tool or maybe a genetic tool or molecular tool, this is the best thing that we've got for aging a skeleton after the age of 26. And then finally, this is our last slide. So trauma, health, and injury, using bones to work out people's nutritional state. I was looking at this, uh, this poor guy again, and uh, he's got lots of issues with his bones. He's got some some pitting that's happening here that's not good that has something to do with poor nutrition um, and like stress and trauma and stuff like that um, lots of diseases so we've got i don't have a picture of rickets here but rickets osteoporosis our our old lady that i showed earlier definitely has osteoporosis sometimes you can determine the cause of death so we have some rib fractures here if somebody's stabbed you can get cut marks on bones um, right here, we've got some blunt force trauma to a bone, gunshot wounds on bones. Um, this is a particular type of fraction called a butterfly fraction. It tends to be when bones are broken on purpose, that where they're snapped, it causes this kind of um, very characteristic fracture pattern. And then if you are looking at broken bones, did that bone break when the person was alive and it healed itself? Like in this case here, not a very good heal, healed injury, but we know it happens you know, long before they died. Did the break happen at the time of death? And what we see is we see microscopic healing beginning to take place, but obviously it's the bone is still broken. Or did someone just accidentally drop the bone in the lab and you have, you have post-mortem trauma? Uh, one of the ways that we determine this is if a bone has, this is maybe the best example here, or maybe right here. If the bone has kind of sharp edges at this edge of the break, then that means that that happened post-mortem, that there's no healing took place. If the bone's edges are a little bit rounded, maybe you can see some microscopic collagen uh, fibers, then that's an indication that the bone broke at the time of death and, and per perhaps was the cause of death. And then obviously an anti-mortem break is one that's healed. So I threw a lot of information out at you guys in a very short period of time. Thank you very much for listening. Um, if folks are interested in finding out more about the Forensic Science Program at the Rutgers Camden campus, the website for our program is listed below. And if you have any questions for me after this session, feel free to email me. Um, but I'll take any of your questions right now. Thank you, Professor Moran. We actually do have one question right now um, from Nancy. And uh, Nancy, you can go ahead. How does brittle bone disease affect your bones? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, there, there are different types of brittle bones disease. That's not the only, like osteoporosis is not the only brittle bones disease. Um, several things can go wrong. Sometimes those osteoplasts that are absorbing bone can mistakenly absorb bone where it's not meant to be absorbed. 
Sometimes where bone is meant to be repaired and fixed, the osteoclasts are no longer working. Um, and sometimes it can be a mineral issue as well. So if you're low in calcium or low in vitamin D, your bones are basically the reserves for those minerals. Those minerals are needed in other cellular functions to operate. So your bones will release those minerals so that your cells can function properly, but it means that they're depleting themselves and they're not being restored. So that's how, yeah, that's what it does. Thank you. I uh, have a question that was sent here to me privately. What led you to becoming a forensic anthropologist? Um, well, I'm actually not a forensic anthropologist. I'm a forensic archaeologist. There is a difference. I could do a whole session on that. <laughs> I misread. Sorry. <laughs> um, I tell folks that it was the best mistake I ever made because it was a complete fluke. It was never intentional. Um, I did always want to be an archaeologist. That was something from, you know, from high school. Um, that was, was what I was going to do with my life. And um, I went to school, I went to Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania, and I got my degree in classical and Near Asian archaeology. So I studied the Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians. And uh, I worked for a year in a type of archaeology known as CRM, cultural resource management. So these are the archaeologists that are sent, they're sent in before they build the pipeline to make sure there aren't any like archaeological resources that are going to get destroyed when they were building Holtec in Camden, uh, because there was state funding associated with that, they had to have that type of archaeology and they found all kinds of amazing Native American stuff on the Camden waterfront. Um, so I did that kind of work for a year and it was great and I loved it, but it pays very, very poorly. Um, and I had a lot of student debt that I had to pay off. So I remember one day driving home from work and there was a billboard advertising for school bus drivers. Be a school bus driver, full benefits. Uh, it was like $12 an hour. And here I was driving home from a day working outside in 95 degree weather with no benefits and I was getting paid $11 an hour. So I realized that this was not going to be a long term career in that type of archaeology. I decided I needed to go to graduate school and um, I specifically was looking for a skill, something that was transferable. And there was a program at University College London called Forensic Archaeological Science. It sounded really cool. But like a lot of people, I thought forensic just meant dead stuff. So I thought I was going to be learning like mortuary archaeology, funerary archaeology, you know, how to excavate human remains. And, you know, great, there's lots of dead things in archaeology. This, this is something I could use any time period, any geographical area. When I got to the United Kingdom on the very first day, I realized that this was not old dead people. This was very much the recently deceased. It was the modern kind of CSI homicide type stuff. But it was the best mistake I ever made. Um, I definitely found like my true calling. And I actually thought that I had left traditional archaeology behind, that now I was just 100% forensic science. Um, but as I was working at Rutgers Camden, um, I got a call from a landowner that required a, an archaeological excavation, similar to what I did when I worked in CRM, um, before he could sell his property for development. And so we turned it into a class that ran for three semesters with Rutgers Camden students where we excavated this like amazing kind of Native American settlement. Sadly for the landowner, he's not going to be able to sell that property, um, but it was a great educational experience for all of us. We recovered over 2,000 artifacts from that site. Um, and then, you know, a couple years after that, the Art Street project happened, and that was a good kind of combination of both my forensic skills as well as my archaeological ones. So I did not leave archaeology behind. I'm still very much doing archaeology, but doing forensic science at the same time. That's great. Well, thank you. I think we're going to leave it there on that note. I want to thank Professor Moran for being here with us tonight, and I hope that everybody stays happy and healthy, and we hope to see you at another webinar soon. Thank you. Thanks for joining us.